Welcome to episode seven of our artist interview series. My name is Bliss. I'm your host, and today I'm joined by Lewis Meyer. Hi, Lewis. Thank you for joining us. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Hey, Trinity. So, my name is Lewis Meyer. I am primarily a composer. I live in Los Angeles, and so a lot of what I do is I write music, orchestral or otherwise. I orchestrate lots of music for other composers. And then I also perform and write on piano or guitar. 
uh, behind me. And I grew up in Detroit. That was a, my path went through many different types of musical phases. I began doing progressive metal rock, got into jazz. And then I went to Berklee College of Music as a jazz guitar performance major. But as soon as I heard the Boston Symphony Orchestra, my path changed yet again. <laughs> and that is pretty much all I wanted to do was to try to write the symphony as good as Gustav Mahler's Fifth, which hasn't happened yet. Probably never will, but <laughs> we're still always striving for that. Of course, that's amazing. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like growing up as a young musician and what opportunities were available to you in, in Detroit? Actually, it's one of those places I, I say, you know, you always have kind of a love-hate relationship with wherever it is that you grew up. But in Detroit, when I look back at it now, the opportunities that are there, especially for young jazz musicians, if you know about it, are, are incredible. So I couldn't have higher praises for everything that went on. I not only had jazz bands in my high school and was able to be chosen to play as the sole jazz guitarist in Michigan Youth Arts Festival, um, festivals, I suppose would be the only way to put it. And there were also ensembles in downtown Detroit. So the Civic Jazz Orchestra was led by Rodney Whitaker. And I believe he's still the head of jazz studies in Michigan State, but he used to play with the uh, Lincoln Center Jazz Band for over a decade. So he's a pretty big name. And if you have people like that, that end up coming back to Detroit to try to foster the next generations of musicians and specifically jazz musicians, they give a lot into those programs. So being able to audition, to have those things there, and then to be able to play with basically the cream of the crop in that area, same age, high schoolers. There was even a very young drummer, David, man that kid can play. And he was only like 12 and in the Civic Jazz Orchestra. So it was an incredible experience. I couldn't be thankful enough for that. Wow, yes, that is incredible. So you've had a lot of exposure to jazz, had a lot of exposures to kind of getting you on your path, but what brought you to Berkeley? Ah, well, yeah, my biggest hero, the guy who changed my life, who got me just skyrocketing into the oh, you know, I, I, I practice like six hours a day, was Steve Vai. So I bet so many people know who that is. He was my ultimate hero. He went to school there, reading about how he would spend hours in the library listening to all different types of music from around the world. It was, that was it. There's just no other place that I could go. It, it had to be. And I did. So it worked out well. <laughs> it did. There's something so... Um magical about composing we haven't had any composers on here yet so that's something really unique that you specifically bring to the table and so what does that look like what does a typical day or a typical practice of composing look like it depends on the day some days it is pulling hair and some days <laughs> some days it flows a little bit better uh i'm a morning person so i do tend to which i know is probably strange when you talk to a lot of people that go to Berkeley or other composers, you're like, I'm a night out. I'm not, I'm not. I, <laughs> I like to get up early in the morning and try to get some movement. And basically I still like to do things in a, I wouldn't exactly call it old fashioned, but putting ideas down, sitting at a piano, pencil to paper, or if it's a specific type of track, that in media composition, so film scoring and such, it's not always gonna be an or orchestra or something that you're working with. It's gonna be uh, a band. So when that happens, I'll maybe pull out a guitar and try to write on a guitar since that's gonna be the primary focus. So a lot of it is just a ton of trial and error. It's a, it's a process of, and if there are anybody, if there is anybody out there who's watching and has always been interested in trying to write their own music, what they might end up finding is that you could be a person who is a little bit more analytical or someone who's maybe a little bit more mm, Im impulsive or intuitive, a little bit more just, you know, I want my feelings to just drive the sound of it. 
I tend to be an analytical person, which means that that likes to try to war. So a lot of my process is trying to balance and just mess around with different sounds, not get stuck too much in the theory of things. So that's the, uh, that's the challenge of sitting to pencil and paper, working things out, finding different ways to play it and writing those ideas down and trying to expand upon them. And that uh, it certainly takes training in theory and, and training your ears and also then just training your instincts and the trust in yourself. So people might think uh, it can look exciting at times or it looks very dull and boring because you could be sitting there just trying to play things in your head for, for hours without doing <laughs> anything that people can see as tangible. Uh, but eventually it comes, eventually it comes to, to fruition. And that's the most exciting part. Right. I love that you mentioned that. What is something, do you think that you can apply your composing to different instruments or once you have some um how do you share it and how does it get um played ah okay so i i hear that as kind of two questions and the first one i think is an extremely important question because it is discussing how it is not the instrument that makes you a musician it is you as a as a person the instrument is just the conduit right. for what it is that you're that you're writing or, or you are going to be performing. So that's where, uh, and this is, it's taken time to, to come to a realization about this, but really important, you're training yourself. So whatever instrument you choose, that might be your primary one, but it doesn't mean that that, that is the thing that gives you the, the purpose as a musician or some, or the only way you you feel that you can be creative, but it's all inside of you first. And then you try to translate that to whatever instrument it is. So it's, it's two processes there. You're learning the technical aspects of whatever instrument you're going to be playing, but simultaneously, you're always trying to view things of, this is just coming from within me, from my understanding. And then I will use this to express my understanding and my inner, my inner music of creativity. So to be able to get those things played then, well, there are a couple different, couple different things. One, if you want to do it all yourself, there are plenty of musicians that do that. And a lot of times I end up having to do that for everything that I can play. Uh, because in this world, we now have computers that we write everything in and we have sample libraries. So you don't need to hire an orchestra in order to get that performed or to, to really go through all of these big audition processes. And then they basically hire the orchestra on your behalf you can get some really convincing sounds out of these computer programs or record all the instruments that you can play to whatever your extent is. And there you go, you have your product and you can, you can do most of it yourself. Otherwise, it all comes down to just meeting people, talking to them, going to concerts, listening to them, seeing if you can talk to them afterwards. Maybe you, you drum up some sort of some sort of friendship and then you just stay in touch and when you have something well now you have some people you can call and if they're available then you have some musicians so it's it can be a long or short process depending on who you know what stage you're in 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 your creation of it and then you just take it one at a time right absolutely that's very true about having the digital aspect now. And that's something that's really going to expedite the process, I'm sure. Um, do you find that you use that a lot even before if you have someone to work with just to see how it sounds? Yes. Yes. It's a very good tool. And also nowadays it's kind of necessary because especially if you are... Well, there are a couple different aspects to that. One, you need to try to have something tangible that sounds as good as possible in order to share or give to somebody who then wants to give you that job or that movie or that performance. And that's kind of what people expect nowadays too, to have things sound pretty close to what they will be live so that there are no surprises 
their ears are telling them immediately, I like this or I don't. And then especially in, in film scoring or video game, you're always demoing those things. So you're creating that final thing there. You're superimposing it with the actual film footage. And therefore people can, without a doubt, know whether they think it works or if they have to tell you to say, well, just try it again. So, so um, it's a good tool for yourself as, as well because your imagination, you can practice it, but it can only go as far, so far, it can only go so far. Uh, so, so it's, it's, it's nice as a, as a composer and a musician to hear it back that way as, as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would like to improve upon as a musician? Like to be able to create better, better mock-ups using those programs? Or just in general, anything you'd like to improve on? Oh, always, always. Uh, <laughs> I mean, first of all, it's just always, always get better at, at writing or performing. But then there are, there are tons of tips and tricks in any program you're using that can make things better. And it's going to be a process that never stops. Not only because you could spend a lifetime, maybe, working on specifically one program, but as we all know, <laughs> like we all got iPhone 13s not too long ago, and already the 14s are out. So <laughs> that's basically it with everything. You're going to get a new thing every year that has more tools to work with things that you can mess around with, it's never gonna stop. So that's kind of a, a nice blessing in a way because why would you wanna stop trying to learn new things? Right, yeah. I like that way of looking at it for sure. Yeah. I know you mentioned that you had earlier, you had a few artists that you mentioned, but are there any artists that really inspire you or that you'd like to perform with one day? Yes. First name that comes to mind, Tigran Hamasyan. So for anybody who doesn't know, I'll tell you a little bit about him and then you can depend, uh, depending on what your, your interests are, you can look him up. But Tigran, he's an Armenian pianist and uh, I haven't heard anything, anything else that that is like his music it is a it is a combination of pretty much so many different types of things around the world and he described his music as modern armenian folk music in the sense that he always has all these melodies that you could you could feel them as as folk melodies as just most people when you say what does a folk melody sound like well i don't know it could be kind of bouncy or very very singable. So he does have those, but his sense of rhythm combined with jazz influences, with classical influences, with heavy metal, like Meshuga influences, it's, it's all into one thing and it is his and his alone. So, oh, not to mention that his rhythmic sense comes from Indian rhythmic training and, and, and music, which is, it's, it's incredibly complicated. So imagine if you are a person who can do all of that simultaneously. It's, it's incredible. And so, yes, I, I would absolutely adore the opportunity to do something with him. And that's the first thing that comes to mind. But then you do have people nowadays, Esa Pekka Salonen would be a really wonderful person to be able to work with. And I've been able to meet him um, twice. Ursula is a lovely human being and he's, he's Finnish and he was a conductor of the LA Philharmonic for over at or over 20 years. And his, his music is, it's quite intense when it comes to what, the way he writes for the orchestra. And I personally love how he interprets a lot of, a lot of existing music as well. So to be able to do something where he was possibly conducting and his feedback on something like that would be would be incredibly invaluable and and pretty much a dream come true to have an orchestra like the LA Phil or somewhere else conducted by him. Whew. That's that's the dream.
Yes, that sounds like a dream for sure. I'm taking a music theory class right now. And um, so all of this is just so interesting and I'm so excited. <laughs> but um, we could talk I, about theory until the cows came home. I yeah. love it. And that probably serves you very well as a composer, I'm sure. You use it all day, all it's the time. Necessary. It's necessary. So, what are some things, what are some of your hobbies, some things you're good at besides composing? Oh, um, well, being out here in California, you have a lot of opportunities to be able to get outside. So I, I really enjoy trail running. So I like to get into the mountains. Uh, being able to get to the Santa Monica Mountains and get some kind of fresh ocean air is really, really wonderful. So I do enjoy doing that a lot. Um, the weird thing is, is that gosh, so much comes down to music things or just, or just you know, sorry, or taking care of my cats. Um, so... So what's like besides that? I, I do really enjoy to cook. That's definitely one. So being able to prep and, and cook a big kind of gourmet fancy meal is something I really enjoy. And come to think of it, when I was at school at Berkeley for a while, every Saturday, that's what I would do. I would spend all the money I didn't have going, walking across the commons to go and get all the groceries early in the morning to then cook like a four course meal and invite a couple friends over with my two roommates uh, at the time as well. So I did, I did that a number of times and that was a ton of fun. So yeah, I would say, I would say those would be, be some things I really enjoy besides pretty much anything involving music. That sounds like so much fun. I'm sure your roommates were very happy too. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. So about your students, what does a typical lesson look like with your students and where does it all kind of start? Ah, okay. Well, the most important thing to me is that I don't consider any of my students to be just my, my music students. I also really try to be a, a mentor as well. So I know there are plenty of times where there could be a good portion, well, I don't know, a portion, we'll just say that at the very least, to where we devote some time to just talking about, about life, about what's going on. You know, if there's some things that are, that are troubling them uh, or some things that I maybe, maybe notice and we'll, and we'll kind of talk some things through if, if that's something that they need. So first and foremost, it's, it's really about getting to know, getting to know everybody. Who are you as a person? What do you enjoy? What are some things you like to listen to? So I ask a ton of questions. I ask a ton of questions. And then from there, we'll try to mix and combine the different facets of kind of what we touched upon earlier, where the music comes from you and then your instrument is the conduit of that. So we certainly are learning an instrument in order to be able to practice those things that are within you and bring them, bring them out externally. So technical practice, we'll find some ways to do that. I do think that being able to read music, at least to a certain extent, you know, we're going to spend some time devoted to, to practicing reading some, some music. Uh, it's a lot like, in, in my view, we as humans, we learn to, to read. We learn to read books. We learn to do that for ourselves. And what we do, we're able to take things in and think about it from purely our perspective. Well, I mean, you're reading somebody else's perspective, but you're the one taking it, thinking about it. So if you're able to read some music, then you're able to do that yourself on your own time. Otherwise, it's all storytelling from one mouth to another. So we focus on technique. And we also focus on learning some things that each student enjoys. You got to have some fun. You got to. Otherwise, what are we doing this for? And then it's about how can we take some of these things we're learning, the songs you already like, how are they built? What, what's the form? Are we doing things major, minor? How did they maybe come up with this? Let's think about that. Combine it with the te technical aspect of your instrument. And how do those specific things make you feel? 
So a lot of what I try to do is to bring those elements back to what is the reason we play, perform, listen to, create music. It's the art of it. It's the expression of it. So what do these things make you think of? What do they make you feel? How can we use that ourselves? So most of it comes back to being able to practice your creative self using these tools of an instrument that we're learning. So that's a little bit abstract, I know. It's not very specific, like we start with this scale in this chord and we go there, but uh, it's a little bit different for everybody. So I try to adapt. Yeah, I love that. I love that explanation. And something that I realized while you were talking is some of the other artists that we've had on here, they talk specifically about um, like this instrument is your instrument. You play guitar, you play violin, you play piano, or your voice is your instrument. And I feel it more here than I have that you, you are your instrument. Like you had said earlier, you are your, you are a musician. That's what makes you, it's you. And then you get to just um, from, from inside emanate it outward and whatever kind of form you choose to fulfill it in. So thank you for bringing that to the table. That's, I think that's super important. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, look at this, here's a piano and it's sitting there. Is anything coming out from it? No, <laughs> so what it, it either takes me or, or again, one of my cats over here to crawl across the keys to make the noise. So you have to play it, it's you. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. What are some of the opportunities that you hope to provide to your students? Oh, yes. Um, well, certainly there are first and foremost, there are tons of studies with this. So uh, I've been also fortunate that my, my girlfriend, my, my partner, she was studying a lot of things involving neuroscience and such. And so I got to, to learn a little bit about what your brain does on music and awesome. it's the best healing tool that we have in, in the world. It's, it's incredible what it does. And therefore it can also be extremely helpful in a number of different ways. This could, this could mean either it helps you uh, with something that could be a, a physical element, like maybe a, a brain body sort of thing, or it can, because it can help carve the neural pathways and things of that nature, or it's, it's a very emotional, it's a very, that the practice of that, of, of learning, of concentrating, it is creating a lot of physical changes in your brain, in your body, and you're also connecting this kind of emotional pathway. These, these are the things I'm feeling, and this is what I'm doing. So the greatest thing that I would hope to do at the very least is to help any student not see their, their, their instrument as their sole musical practice and to then become extremely competitive with, with others and make that into a type of type of job in, in some sense. I, I know I did that at a, for, for a bit. It was, it was so much like, I need to practice this much. I need to do this and that. And to devote time to what we touched on earlier is what is this, what does this make you feel? So that is practice. You're practicing something specific. It's a technique. It's a sound palette, but taking that moment and if anybody knows this, there's a outstanding musician, Jacob Collier. I highly encourage anybody to look him up because he talks about this a lot. And I grew, I, uh, I took a lot of inspiration from what he says. So Jacob Collier, and that was a question that was posed to him a lot when he was young. What is that interval or that tone? What does that feel like to you? As opposed to what is that or something? You know, making it personal and you start to build that repertoire. So when you do that, you also gain the tools for you to use music and to produce it yourself, whatever that means, 
even if it's just, this is just for me in my own living room, or I do want to create things and record it and put it out there. Or I really do want to be one of those people that is on that stage producing it live for everyone else out there in the audience. There's a whole spectrum and the tools that you're beginning with are the same for anybody going through all of those, all of those stages. What does it mean to you? How do you use it? And how do we learn those tips and tricks to use for yourself, uh, for that emotional support, for that practice of combining your physical body with, with your mental capacities and your creative soul. And um, then depending on what any, any student wants to do with, with what they're like there, I would hope to encourage them and to be able to offer maybe connections. These are some people I know, you wanna go down this path? I would love to put you in touch with this person or hear things, have you thought about that you can apply to this? Really any of that kind of support that any student needs to have the best shot at achieving what it is that they feel they really want to do. That, that's, the, that's the best thing. Yeah, those are wonderful opportunities and that feels like that can go in so many different directions, which is great. And so that leads right into my next question is that since there's what you do is laying a foundation for so many different pathways of music, do your students get to practice whatever sort of genre that they feel or instrument that they like based on um, the composure of it? I mean, absolutely. When it comes to, when it comes to genres, a hundred percent. I know for me, the only two instruments I would feel comfortable actually teaching this is how you play this instrument would be guitar and piano since those are my primaries as a composer you learn how you know a plethora of other instruments work and you you know how to play them but you can't play them physically so i i would be able to to teach people how to to understand all these different instruments and how you can end up using them. Um, and, and that's part of what, it all depends on what kind of music you wanna to write too. So, um, did that answer the question? I feel like I kinda, I kinda lost something there. <laughs> oh yes, I, I think they answered the question that they, okay. you can, know about multiple it was kind of a hard question too but they can know about multiple instruments and kind of have that knowledge but when it comes to specific things you're there for the, i got the point i think i hope yeah. everyone else <laughs> yeah otherwise if there are specific instruments that you you heard i, I love the sound i want to know how to do that well then especially if you are this is why when you are at Berkeley or something, it's, it's a really invaluable experience or another music school that you can find some of the people that play those instruments you don't play and you can listen to them, see how they do it, ask them some questions. And, and that's how you gain the knowledge firsthand. And you might actually be able to push somebody else to, to find out that they can do something or that their instrument can do something they didn't know before. So that's kind of the cool thing is that nobody's limited to, to what they know. There's always, there's always something new. Always. Always something to learn. Yeah. So you mostly, my guess is offer online lessons, but are there any in-person lessons that you offer as well? There, there are a few students I'm teaching in person here in Los Angeles. So it um, kind of all depends. Uh, so far, doing it online has worked really, really well. We've been able to iron out tons of different kinks, and it's been since mm, since the summer of 2020 or something, so two, a little over two years of, of doing it this way. And to be honest, in the beginning, I was really skeptical, but it was something that we were all trying. It's worked out wonderfully, and a lot of it also has come down to, this is where me as a teacher, it is my job. It's not a super job. It is my job that when we're doing something this way, and if I notice that something isn't being grasped that quickly or there's a lot of confusion, well, it is up to me to figure out how to adapt and to find a way 
to have that idea come across in a way that whatever the student, however they need it, they can understand and they can then implement it. So this is where uh, anybody will find you can be more of a visual learner and you have to see things written out or very clearly defined that way. Others, you could just hear it performed and you've latched onto it. So online lessons, mostly, I would say about 90%. And, and, and it's been, it's been a really great experience being able to, to, to challenge myself sometimes to find the ways to make those things come across via, via camera. Yeah, that's great. I'm so happy to hear that that's been working well and that that's given you the opportunity to become an even better teacher. So yeah. yeah. What are some things that you tell your students to inspire them to practice? I tell them if they don't, then their parents are going to ground them. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is really weird when I'm teaching an adult. I, no, that, one, that one's strange. Um, well, one instance in particular comes to mind. I, I have this one very talented student his ears are incredible and he'll latch on to things and that's the best way for him to learn and he's really excited about this piece that he's learning and we'll only be able to get through so much in a single half an hour lesson so it is okay so we did this the only way that we're going to be able to get to that next part that you really want to do is that you practice this so you have it down by the next time we get together so it's kind of a what is the opportunity ahead once you get this look what's coming so that's that's the main motivation it's never well you just have to practice this because that's what you do no it's so look at this once you can get this then that means you're able to do this thing and look what we're going to go to next so what's that one really great song that you want to learn okay that one that one in order to do that, we kind of have to do this stuff first. So that's without getting very specific, because again, it's different for every person. That's the main thing I try to, to use is we want to get here. This is the thing that gets us there. So let's look, let's look forward. Yeah, right. It's an incentive sort of thing, because it, it really is true. More that you, that even inspires me to practice now. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Look. <laughs> Like, what is, what is the thing that you want to be able to, to do a little bit down the line? Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm, so, I'm asking you, though. I want to I wanna know a quick little thing that Trinity wants to do. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, so I'm a singer and songwriter. I write my own music, too, and I play guitar. And I actually have, again, I'm recording my first album, and I'm super excited. So... <laughs> Of course, there's the, so what is it? Well, you have an album that you really want to record and you want to do really well? Absolutely. So you have these few days to really work on that stuff so that when you get in the studio, you're not feeling as nervous. You feel prepared and ready to do it. And then, and then it's beautiful. There's the motivation right there. Of course. Thank you. I'm going to practice right after this. <laughs> Seriously. Oh. What? Um, Your album. I'm sorry, what? I'm excited to hear your album. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. What brought you to Lily Theater? Ah, well, I saw a, you know, this was all still during, during pandemic times and stuff too. And so trying to find some, some other opportunities to, to find some more students. And Lily had posted on the Berkeley Alumni Board. So we had... I think, it, I think it was one of the first ones. So we had a phone interview even before, I mean, things were just starting to get going. This was the very, very beginning. And, and speaking to her, the, the vision and the goals that she wanted to achieve were really, really inspirational. And those are the kind of, the kind of, hmm, what would be the right word? Those would be the, 
the acts of goodwill that I would want to do as, as a human as well is to open up these opportunities for lots of people who, who wouldn't otherwise be able to, to have them or, or other children or grownups who are perhaps neurodivergent and maybe uh, there are people who don't understand how, how music can really help uh, unique brains like, like that or, or also make it a, a teacher that, that really wants to understand or to help further understanding. So everything just sounded really, really impactful. We're gonna open this up to try to help those who need it most. And that's just a wonderful thing about being human. We have the capacity to do that. So that's that's what that's what made me sign on was talking to her. It wasn't just the job things like that. It was finding what she wanted to do. Yeah, it's a beautiful mission. There's some beautiful souls that have come together to make us Lily Theater, make us help all these students that we have and continuing to grow. So it's all very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. What are some, if you have any parting words that you'd like to say to everyone or just anything else you'd like us to know about you? Hmm. Well, parting words, okay, the first thing that comes to mind uh, this is also, it, it helps, hopefully, because you can expand upon this, anybody who wants to. There was, there's a book out there, it's called Big Magic. Oh, why am I forgetting, I'm forgetting the author's name right now, Elizabeth. Uh, people might know her because she wrote the book and then they made the subsequent movie. Um, which that's even escaping my mind right now. Julia Roberts, she goes on a trip around the world. Um, we love, that's it. So she became Elizabeth Gilbert. Okay, Elizabeth Gilbert wrote a book called Big Magic. <laughs> and she was known for writing that book, which turned into the movie Eat, Pray, Love. And in that book, basically what she, one of the main messages is as an artist, don't get stuck or held up on that, on that one thing you're doing right now and expect that to change everything too. You focus on, on one thing at a time. You put, you put your best effort into it, whatever that is at the time. You put it out there. And once you put it out there, go on to the next. So it's about don't get held up on all the really small things and, and putting all your eggs in one basket. In a way, this, all of this is supposed to be fun at the end of the day, whatever it is that you're doing. So if you're going to one audition or you're releasing your one album or, or just that is your one concert there, well, look at each one of those things as this is the one I'm doing now and I'm going to do my best. And then once that one's over, I'm going on to the next and I'm going to try to keep just getting out there and getting out there and doing my thing. And if you enjoy your thing, there is 0% chance, absolutely 0% chance that you are the only one that enjoys it. So that is the cool thing is that as a musician, as an artist, if you are doing something that you truly enjoy. There are many other people out there just like you who will enjoy it too. So that, that would be my, that'd be my advice for anybody, including myself. Uh, <laughs> right now. That is so amazing. That was probably the best advice I've heard in a very long time. And well, you flatter me. <laughs> Thank you. But again, big magic. If you that could be a good book to read. Yeah, absolutely. I just feel so full and so excited I'm sure that everyone else who is watching is feeling the same way. So I'm so grateful to not only get to meet you, but to get to talk with you about what you do and your instrument and all the things that you bring to the table. We're so happy. And um, anyone who is interested in taking lessons with Lewis, with Lewis, you can give us an email at info at lilytheatercompany.org. Make sure to 
subscribe to our YouTube channel and listen into our podcast, follow all of our social medias, and thank you so much. Thank you, Trinity. It's really great to meet you today as well. All right, we'll see you guys next time.